Well, thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, my name is Adrian Wren. I'm a project leader at Valley Vision. Valley Vision is a nonprofit located here in Sacramento, focused on improving quality of life in the six county Sacramento region. Um, this happens to be the quarterly luncheon of the Clean Air, Air Partnership. The Clean Air, Air Partnership is a coalition of environmental regulators, business groups, and environmental advocates who work together to advance clean air in the six county Sacramento region. Uh, we're here joined by our co-chair, John Lane. John, you want to raise your hand? Give him a round of applause. <laughs> John's with Tiger. And John, how, how long have you been with the Clean Air Air Partnership? 20 years. 20 years. Oh my goodness. And that's not a joke. <laughs> that's not a joke. John's a wonderful, wonderful partner in all, all of the Clean Air Partnership does. Um, for those of you who, who are not familiar with the Clean Air Partnership, it's actually been around since 1986. 1986, and it was founded by uh, Green California, at the time the American Lung Association, and the Metro Chamber. And the idea was to bring, bring together uh, different types of groups to advocate together for clean air. Um, so today, you know, it includes business leaders, environmental advocates, nonprofits, and our region's five air quality management districts. And really is a unique partnership, so we, we appreciate your time today. Uh, to really to learn uh, from our friends at SACOG um, about their blueprint process and the, the awesome things that they're doing with this, this cycle of that process. Um, so before we get started, I'd like to do some thank yous to our, to our, um, to our uh, sponsors. I'm seeing someone wearing green suspenders. Very, very, uh, that's actually our other CAP co-chair. So can we give Eric White a round of applause? So thank you to our event sponsors, the SAC Metro Air District, Tigert, SMUD, Sutter Health, the Sacramento Association of Realtors, the Placer County Air Pollution Control District, the Yolo Solano Air Quality Management District, PG&E, the El Dorado County Air Quality Management District, CEMEX, and we have two new uh, CAP contributors who are actually joining us today. Um, uh, Sean with Clarity, where are you? Okay, so Sean, uh, is with Clarity, which is a, a air quality monitoring company. They manufacture air quality monitoring devices that I know Valley Vision has been using for our uh, air quality monitoring projects. So thanks, Sean, for being a CAP member. Then our other new CAP member is Nicola Motors. Do we have Sam with Nicola Motors with us today? He might come late. Um, Nicola is a manufacturer of uh, zero emission heavy duty trucks, um, and they're doing a lot uh, in California and in, in the country around that. So uh, thank you to them. <coughs> So, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the restrooms are accessible to the left when you exit this room. You do need a key. You can get them at our reg table. Um, Laurel's holding them up right there. Uh, and then the food, there's a whole bunch of burritos over there, so please, we cut them in half, so we, we, you know, we'd have like 150 of these. Um, but you really need two to have a full meal, so go get another half, at least in my experience. Uh, so, go get another half if you want that half. We got a lot of food over there from our friends at Los Cerritos, which is on 25th and Broadway. Um, we're not going to do introductions around the room. Oftentimes we, we do that. I like to do that, but it didn't take too long. Um, but I do want to bring up um, my friend Jennifer Finton at Green California Sacramento Region. Um, we did have a Clean Air Partnership partner, a longtime partner, Jane Hagedorn, who was CEO of Breathe for 33 years, passed away earlier this week. And I wanted to invite Jennifer up to say a few words. Thank you. Um, ironically, one of the things that Jane mentored me on was public speaking, so we'll see, <laughs> see how this goes. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure this uh, group knew that Jane had passed earlier this week. Um, she basically uh, came up with the idea for this partnership. And it was th these kinds of ideas that really move this region forward in finding solutions to our vast air quality challenges. So, just want to take a moment to let you all know um, arrangements have not been um, made yet. But uh, personally, she was my mentor uh, and friend. So, I'm sorry. And could we have a moment of silence for Jane, just briefly? Thank you. And I also, I did a little bit of research. I, I never had the opportunity to meet Jane, but I did. And we have some folks in the room who, who have known Jane for a very long time. just want to recognize that. 
Um, but I did find some really interesting facts about Jane that I wanted to share. Um, she was the first woman um, on the Sacramento County Planning Commission. She was the founding president of the Sacramento Tree Foundation when it was established. Um, and one of the big victories that she was really proud of was the passage of Prop 99 in 1988, which reduced smoking by 30, 37%, or its credit with reducing smoking by that amount. So really powerful and well-respected uh, and, and minister. Um, with that, I would like to transition into what we're going to be talking about today, which is the SACOG blueprint process. And of course, we have SACOG leadership with us today um, to give us a bit of a primer on the process, but not just a primer on the process, a history as well of how that process started. Um, and so I'm going to bring up James Corliss, as well as Casey Lazon with SACOG, and they're going to go through their slides. I've got a clicker for you. Um, Cha-ching. And please take it away. Thank you. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. So much better, so much better. Um, all right, well, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm James Corliss, I'm executive director. Casey Lazon. Just say hi. Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. I'm Casey Lazon, deputy executive director for Planning Humorists. So, we're doing a little tag team on this presentation. Um, and, and I think I want to just preface this um, by saying what we're really talking about, uh, some of you I think have been around perhaps for quite a while, you maybe you remember the original blueprint plan that was done 20 years ago in this region that people still remember uh, fondly and for good reason. Um, and we are now about to update our long range plan and we are calling it blueprint because we think it's time, 20 years, after the adoption of the blueprint, just about 20 years, to really take a step back, take a pause, and ask, where is this region heading? Our up ne next plan will go out to the year 2050. So we want to give you a little bit of history today. Just a reminder, if you, if you, if you weren't around 20 years ago, what, what, why we came up with the blueprint. We want to give you a little bit of a report card kind of on how, how we're doing, and then we want to give you a little bit of a teaser on why we need each and every one of you and a hundred of your closest friends to get involved in the next update of this program. I am uh, a proud parent of three teenagers, and I have that anxiety about, like, my kids are leaving home, they're all bunched up really close, pretty soon they're all going off to college, and we've gone through our first college application process with my oldest. And now comes my next, uh, my junior. And uh, his grades are okay. <laughs> this is not being recorded, right? My, uh, <laughs> so, having gone through the stress of college applications with my oldest daughter, now comes my son. And his grades are okay. And my wife and I have this conversation, we're like, you know, you're kind of like not on the right track. You kind of got some bad habits you're going to have to kind of correct and pay attention to. His answer is, uh-huh. It's a classic 16-year-old boy. And we're trying to make this case like, look, we're looking to the future. Right? We care about you. If you don't actually start to do things a little bit differently, like, this is not going to go well. This whole college thing is, you know, it's going to be hard. You've got to get your grades up. You have to get better study habits. So sure, you're having fun right now, you're 16, you're enjoying life, but you gotta think about the future. Still, the answer is mm hmm But that's a little bit of what I wanna preface today with, which is, it is understandable that most people, even decision makers in this region, think about the next two years or four years. And coming out of COVID and the pandemic, you know, even some of our signs may be, well, you know, okay, things aren't so bad. You know, this, this is okay if you're doing okay. If you're not doing okay, it's not good at all. Um, but our job as a regional planning agency is to think across all of these 28 cities and counties, the entire six-county region, and to think across time. And what we're trying to tell you today is we may not be on the right track. How can you help us change this so that we have a better future for every single person? lives here and who hasn't been born yet. So with that, Casey, tell us a little bit about the history of the blueprint. 
Thanks, James. Thank you very much for that. Um, so just to, just to level set, um, for those of you who already understand what SACOG is, please just have a bit of patience. Um, Sacramento Area, Area Council of Governments, we are a, um, uh, a joint powers authority of the 22 cities and the six counties of the Sacramento region. That's what's on the map there. We have uh, responsibilities under federal and state law for regional transportation and housing planning. Um, we also do uh, um, regional transportation funding, which is to implement the transportation plan that we create. And this is uh, the creation of this plan and the uh, happens on a four-year cycle. The, everything we do is implementing that plan all the time, even as we are updating the plan. And uh, let's look back actually before 20 years, um, to a time, uh, before 20 years ago, to a time when we were doing uh, the update of this plan, as is always required of us to do. And we have to look out at least 20 years into the future, and we have to estimate how many people are going to be here, how many jobs, how many homes, what's that look like out on the ground, and then the transportation system. Ultimately, that's like our charge, the transportation system, and we have to make sure that we measure to make sure that when that transportation system, if it goes into place, all of the roads, all the highways, all the transit, you know, um, sidewalks, bike lanes, all the surface transportation infrastructure that we use every day, when that gets built out over time, um, it has to uh, allow us to, to clean the air up. It can't make air quality worse. Um, that's our requirement under the Federal Clean Air Act uh, and under, under state law as well. So this was around the turn of the century, a little before 2000. And we did that, and the way that we had been doing that for a long time was uh, SACOG is uh, the Council of Governments for all the cities and counties. We would, um, through a process, through a public process, we would basically be pulling all of the transportation projects from every city and county, and we kind of stapled them together. I mean, maybe you wouldn't say that was exactly it, but that was basically what we did. We said, okay, we're just going to collect it from everyone and staple it together. And that, we got called on that. <laughs> Um, around uh, 1999, this is uh, headlines from the Sacramento Bee, um, we got called on that. Can't do that anymore. Because, you know, people had concerns about smog and scrawl, like you're just kicking the can down the road. And, and I'm, some of you know this story, because uh, I see some people who are here from the original blueprint, and so I appreciate your patience with this, but I think it's important for us, um, for those of us who are here, to remember that story because then what ensues after that is really important and special and it's a foundation for us to try to continue to work from. So after that, uh, that episode, um, then the SACOG uh, board and members decided to, do, uh, to update that plan in a different way. And so they tried um, to create a plan that was more collective and coordinated among all the cities and counties, but nevertheless, when they created that plan that went out 20 years to the future and had a $25 billion budget of public investment, they saw that they were creating a future where congestion was getting much, much worse for the investment and the air quality was getting much, much worse. And so and they, they went through all kinds of you know iterations, all, oh, let's, okay, let's just widen all the roads or let's just put it all into transit. At the end of the day, what they realized was, we have to look at the underlying land use conditions. How are local cities and counties, you know, what are their policies, and how is a lot of those policies being built out? And that couldn't be accomplished in a uh, regular plan update. That is when the study that is now known as the blueprint was started. And so, fundamentally, the blueprint was a voluntary project of all of the cities and counties in the region, and I would say of also all of our non-governmental partners in the region, this was a two and a half year effort that engaged um, public, private, and nonprofit sector across the region to ask this question, what is the best way for us to accommodate growth and improve the quality of life in the region? Knowing that we are a growing region, we want to be growing, we don't want to be growing. How do we accommodate that in such a way that it can actually improve quality of life for everyone here today and in the future? And so we went through a very robust public engagement process. We did a lot of uh, uh, scenario planning. So we looked at how many, what our projections were to grow 50 years out into the future. 
and we created a base case vision of that. So we take all of the development trends and all of the public transportation investment trends in the last few years and we project that into the future. What does that look like? And it looked terrible. We called that a base case. And then we went out through um, dozens and dozens of community <coughs> workshops to share this information and say, okay, we want to try out some different principles for growth with you. And we had these conversations and really across the region, scenario development that was trying to use some principles that are now called uh, smart growth principles, um, they quality design principles. Um, maybe they, you know, for a lot of us, these are very familiar. Some, they look maybe uh, common sense. Some of them may seem a little bit outdated, but there, you know, there's some tried and trueness there for like when you're talking about your built environment. So try these principles out. One, transportation choice. If we want to accommodate growth by uh, building a community where people have the option to take different modes of travel, not just driving in a car by themselves, what would that have to look like? If we want people to have housing choice, so they have the choice to uh, purchase a single family home on a large lot and also they have a choice to um, rent or purchase uh, an attached home, which could be a condo, an apartment, or a townhome, or whatever, or a smaller single family home. What would it look like for us to design our communities for housing choice? What would it look like a compact development if we were to design a community where things are closer together, so it just takes a shorter amount of distance to get to them? Both homes, but also shopping, schools, parks, jobs, etc. Use existing assets was a, is a principle of what would a future look like if we try to use the public infrastructure we have, use the underutilized or vacant lots that we have on our commercial corridors, in our neighborhoods, use that first before we go out and um, build on land that has never been developed. What would it look like if we mixed land uses? So if we had communities where um, you, you have a, your home, but there are other kinds of homes there, and you could also get to destinations, your daily destinations, um, close by. And what would it look like if we created a future where we wanted to uh, conserve our natural resources? Um, the Sacramento region, like the Central Valley, is we feed the world, right? So we have very valuable farmland. We also have very valuable um, water supply for ourselves and for the state. Uh, we have forest land, we have a lot of these natural resources that serve us and also protect us. Um, and then the next principle of quality design. What if we did this in a way that was centered on human scale development? Because at the end of the day, neighborhoods are habitat, they're habitat for humans. And so what would it look like for us to design at that scale? So we tested these out in all of these different um, uh, in events over a very long period of time. And at the end of the day, we came up with a blueprint. Um, I'm moving through this. This was the base case footprint of our region. So it just shows in the red areas where existing development was across our six counties and in the key areas, um, what future development would look like if we had taken past trends and projected them out into the future. Um, and then this is the blueprint future that ultimately was developed through that two and a half year, again, voluntary process, nobody told us to do this. Um, what happened was, through all of those workshops, people tried out these principles and they really liked them, and they gave us input on how they might want to see that in their communities, and over the course of that, we ended up developing this vision for the region where you can see that pink area, the future development, it's less than half the size of the uh, pink area from the base case. That was employing all of those different principles. And what happened was, when we created um, uh, these two scenarios, well, the base case, um, if you take what you've always done and you project it in the future, <laughs> you were increasing congestion, and later on you were able to uh, measure greenhouse gas emissions, right? Those things were going up. And housing choices, transportation choices, farmland open space natural resources, like that was all uh, uh, declining because in the base case future, we were doing a lot of um, outward expansion of um, development on new land, we'll call it greenfield development, 
um, which in and of itself is okay, right? But it was fairly low density, so taking up lots of land. It was, uh, you know, lots of single-family homes, separated from jobs, everyone had to drive. There was no way you could really serve any of that with transit. And so that's why on the right-hand side you see all of these things declining. By applying those principles, uh, the blueprint version of the future, we saw reductions in the rates of congestion. Not going to lie, congestion is always there, especially if you're going to add, you know, a million new people. But, but the rate of that increase was not outpacing population growth, right? That's, that's important. Um, lower air pollution, less consumption of our natural resources and water consumption because there was just more efficient use of land. It was mixing it together, um, and it was also increasing people's ability. It was increasing transportation options because you could actually provide better transit service. We had neighborhoods where people actually could walk to some daily destinations or ride a bike. Um, there was this focus on housing options, so uh, trying to see where could you bring in medium and higher density homes into existing places, but also with the future into greenfield development. The mixing of land uses, all of this started to shrink that footprint and actually bring people closer to their daily needs and closer to each other. <coughs> so that was the blueprint. Um, it was over that time period supported by, like I said, a lot of people, a lot of organizations, many of you were in this room. Uh, and it was adopted by the St. Cobb Board that has every city and county and in um, the region sitting on that board. And then uh, it was at that point, because it was voluntary, it was voluntarily implemented, which means that when SACOG moved forward to do our next required transportation plan, we built on that momentum, right? We worked with every city and county saying, look, we just went through this whole process together. How are you planning to implement the blueprint in your community? And so that is the conversation that we've had over time. I will say, um, James is gonna go into a report card and it's gonna, um, spoiler, there's Mixed messages and not all of it's great news. We did have a lot of plan, uh, plan updates that happened uh, in cities and counties. And a lot of that was incorporated as principles. And so there has been some good stuff that's happened as well. Um, so, you know, to leave you on a note that's not totally dire, but do prepare for some bad news. All right, I'm going to stop here. All right. Yeah. Other new all are welcome to ask questions or, you know, clarify so whatever, you know, we don't. Have to just have this just be us talking the whole time. So, are there any so far any questions, any fond memories from 2003 sitting in the convention center with a bunch of clickers? Who wants to share? All right, here's what we're going to do this is a very scientific exercise I'm going to put you through right now. We're going to ask you to just raise your hands in the following three options. The first option is we're on a pretty good path in terms of how we're growing as a region. The second option is we're not on a very good path. And the third is I'm not sure. I need some more information. All right, first option, we're on a good path. We're on a good path. Well, come on, good path people. Do not invite a good path people. Okay, we got a good one. Right, we got one here. Do I have another? Do I have another? No, all right. We're not on a good path. We're not on a good path. This side of the room. All right, and you're not sure. All right, a lot of unsure people over here. A lot of, a lot of uncertainty. All right, that's good. It's good. It's okay. I'm going to be uncertain. Um, okay. Okay, here's my son's report card. I mean, the region's <laughs> report card. Sorry. It's a very, very uh, intense discussion this morning with him. Um, <laughs> as you can tell. As you can tell. Uh, and we're not a 16 year old. I just want you, there's no comparison. All right, so here's a little bit. Now, this is on our website. We've done two report cards, one in 2017, one in 2021. So I'm going to run through this data. It's probably not going to shock anybody here. There's lots of data in this, um, in this report that's on our website from 2021. And if you can see the lines here. Um, and so this is basically looking at um, home prices, right? And I, I think this is all over the news. Everybody feels it. We used to long ago be the affordable option of the Bay Area. That is no longer true. And this chart kind of shows you why. Now, this stops in 2020. So updated numbers, I think, might even show this works. But our home values are increasing 
Obviously, the Bay Area, LA, and San Diego, the coastal metropolitan regions, are ahead of us just in terms of um, overall home value. But we are we are accelerating, right? And I would imagine the last couple of years would actually show an even stronger acceleration. COVID, people moving here, um, so I think that is not shocking. Rent prices. Um, so let me just explain a little bit. Again, I don't think this is shocking to anybody. This is a metropolitan statistical area. I think it actually includes, uh, no, it does not include Yubisa, which is a different MSA. The title on this slide, by the way, is a little confusing. I, I did a little, uh, made sure I checked my staff. Uh, this is the average rent increase from 2014 to 2020. So increase in rents, right? Among what we call, and by the way, sidebar, I don't really love us comparing ourselves to the Bay Area in LA and San Diego. Like, I think we're way better than that, by the way. Um, but I do think that we need to think about all these other uh, mid-sized metropolitan regions across the United States. Because guess what? They think about us. They watch us. So if we're watching the Bay Area, and like, no, we're, we're watching the wrong folks. These are our peers, and among our peers, this is a very, these are very important peer comparisons. I know people say, well, California is different. You know, they don't have CEQA in Utah. It's true, um, but our rent prices have skyrocketed, right? So we have a housing crisis. I don't think, again, that's going to shock anybody in this room. We also have a housing crisis that falls completely unevenly based on race ethnicity. So if you're white, your your cost burden. In other words, how much you're paying? Uh, are you paying? Uh, over half of your income, between 30, the, the blue is over half, the orange is between 30 and 50 percent. Uh, black households, Latino households, way higher cost burden. And also, by the way, if you look at household wealth as well, huge racial disparities in what we've uh, built or not built in terms of the racial wealth gap in housing in this region is very stark. So, not only the housing crisis, that housing crisis is falling very unevenly, unevenly on people. Um, a little bit of a look back to the sort of beginning of the blueprint. Uh, this is basically our population growth year to year, starting in 2001. Uh, on the very, the, the, the solid orange line is the actual uh, housing growth, number of units of housing. And you see there the big run up in the 2000s, right? This is what everybody knows. Same across the country, but honestly, we had a higher peak here and we had a harder fall. So into the Great Recession, and slowly coming out of the Great Recession, our population growth. And if you add that actual housing unit growth, right, cumulatively over time, the last two decades, that has added up to a severe shortage of housing, right, at all income levels, but particularly low and moderate income. Now, now Casey gave you some great maps in terms of the region and our growth patterns and the blueprint from 20 years ago. And I like to simplify things, and I would say basically our blueprint is a sort of a balanced portfolio of urban infill, suburban revitalization, and some phased greenfield growth. We do have greenfield growth in our long-range plan, but it's a healthy mix in many ways. It's a balanced portfolio, but we also have a lot of different housing product types. So it isn't just all large lot single family. Um, and, and, and this, these kinds of product types are really important. I know we see more of these, maybe, we think maybe about more of them in the urban core, but it's you know sometimes referred to as missing middle. So we have attached product. We have small lot single family, which actually is a big popular product type and just from a growth and blueprint perspective, putting single family houses on smaller amounts of land is a huge benefit. It is a big deal for this, this uh, our regional growth strategy or blueprint. And then we have large lot, single family, and then rural residential. So those are kind of the product types, just because I'm going to show you the next slide in terms of how we've been doing on those product types and what we think we need. So cumulatively, remember that big run-up I showed you, 2000s, right? The aughts, 01 to 07, right? Those are the See, blue, rural, residential, green, single family, large lot, small lot, and orange, and magenta is attached product, right? So that's what we had. Then we had the Great Recession. We've slowly come out of that. And then from the last uh, three years, we have updated numbers on these, but 
when we did this report card, uh, right, we were we were uh, you know showing about 2,900 units on average a year of, of large lot single family, 2,500 and 1,200 attached. In our plan, the last adopted plan out to 2040, that's the product mix that we say we need, right? So look at that last bar graph there. That's the mix on attached product, attached housing. And frankly, if we could even build that, which we do think is a market for, and we do think is like largely financially feasible, but for a lot of friction in the system, like zoning that doesn't allow it, and um, a lot of things that Casey will talk about in a second, um, it, is, it is not impossible to see that, and we will only, if we even achieve that, we won't really bump the total numbers of the attached product, we'll bump them up well, we need to bump up the tax product, but it'll be about a third of our end state housing kind of product mix. So we're not talking like everybody's living in apartments in the future. We're saying people have choices. A um, little bit on Rena. I'm going to kind of go here and then hand it off to Casey uh, again here. Uh, our regional housing needs allocation, right, is a requirement from the state looking at are we zoning for our population increase? Um, we just adopted our last. Rena in 2019, and this is looking back before that, and basically what we're showing is what the previous slide showed you, which is we're not, we're not actually getting our Rena targets, our Rena goals, uh, especially on the very low and low, which is sort of translated to that attached product. Okay, final um, slide is, uh, you know, Casey talked a little bit about farmland um, and, and sort of the uh, natural resources and conservation, the importance, the economic importance of our, of our natural open space areas, our forests, our floodplains. Well, you can see here in terms of how much farmland we've consumed uh, over the last 20 years. Again, huge in, the, in, the, in those 2000s, lots of farmland consumed. We, are, we have consumed much more farmland than the original blueprint from 20 years ago said we should consume. We're going to consume some. This is much more. So we have we have we have developed more of that than we said we should. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit. It's mostly just a kind of a, a it's a teaser for the upcoming plan. And then Casey's going to talk a little bit about this implementation strategy called Green Means Go, which is actually critical that we try to get more of that urban and suburban infill happening. So a new plan called the Blueprint. Right. This is what you're going to see. A lot, I'm going to, we'll probably see this a few times. We have a big public event on June 16th in Folsom. Please join us. Registration is open. Uh, we also are doing pop-up events all over the region. And even on your uh, sheet there on your desk, you have a QR code. You can take a survey. You can take it right now. Take it when you go home. Friends and family, like, share it around. Uh, take that survey. Uh, because we're trying to get as much input right now uh, as we can on the beginning of this new plan. We're starting by a triple bottom line framework. So we want to maximize uh, equity in reducing, reducing disparities, reducing racial disparities in terms of how we grow in housing and transportation. We want to maximize economic prosperity, but also uh, economic prosperity per our economic prosperity plan that uh, we, we did with Valley Vision a couple of years ago. And finally, obviously, cleaner air, less air pollution, less greenhouse gas emissions, but also paying a lot of attention to a more ad, um, adaptation and resilience in terms of our regional investments. We are now developing, and we have developed, three alternative, what we call growth pathways, three alternative land use scenarios. Um, and we're in the process of modeling these right now, out to the year 2050. So these are what we call crash test dummies. We will not be asking you or the region to pick one of these. We are looking at them in terms of what difference it will make. Pathway one is a very outward expansion pathway where most of our growth happens on the edge. Pathway two is uh, sort of a balance of infill and expansion. And pathway three is going to be largely infill on our existing urbanized footprint, both, both sort of urban and suburban. And OK, I, did, I didn't know this was actually the phase. And then just a final, final before I, I hand it back to Casey, here's another kind of updated version of our, of, our, of our region, right? So in gray is the existing sort of developed areas, urban, suburban, the urban, urbanized footprint, if you will. Uh, um, we're going to walk through these. So very, uh, the blue is floodplain, and red is high fire risk. You, I'm sure, know these maps. We're thinking about flooding right now, of course, more than ever. 
right? And we're trying to figure out how are we going to grow as a region, how are we going to actually adapt to climate change, how are we going to accommodate our future population growth, which is which is coming, uh, but do it in a way that doesn't actually uh, is is a place that our kids and our grandchildren can live and afford to live in. And I'll just give you one uh, preview right now, right? That first pathway of outward expansion, way more development in those higher fire risk areas, pathway two, much less than three, right? So we're gonna be coming at uh, the, the region and, and, and engage everybody in a lot more of this kind of data over the next couple of months in terms of what does it mean in terms of how we grow, where we grow, what kind of housing we provide, for what income levels, et cetera. So, I hope you stay with that in terms of our report card. Now I'll hand it back to Casey for one program that we think is kind of the quintessential idea for how to actually make all this work and get back on track. Okay. Thanks, James. Uh, because as we update our plan, we are continuing to implement it, right? So, got an implementation program for you. So, because um, James and I and the Stakehog staff have looked at the uh, report card indicators that you saw, we've, we've looked at that a lot. So there are some things in, in that that, um, that lead up to this slide and what I want to talk about. So one of them is um, we have not been building enough housing, period. We've not been building enough housing in the places where we need it to be built. And we haven't been building the right kind of housing in the places that we need it to be built. And James alluded to that, this is, uh, in particular, we're looking at um, smaller lot and attached housing product types in um, closer in places, right? Location efficient places. So we're talking about downtowns, main streets, commercial corridors, um, train station areas, right? These are all places that are locally identified for um, higher density growth, for infill, for mixed use development. But we've seen in the last 20 years, they've been struggling to come online. And so when we, fin uh, when we were developing our last plan, 2018 about, we were seeing these stats and we're figuring out, okay, what do we need to do to change that? Because that's a bad sign. We know we need to have housing, we know we need to have a balanced portfolio, but this part of the portfolio is really struggling. And so we got together with, uh, we pulled all of our city and county planning and economic development staffs, we asked for um, market rate and affordable housing developers to come meet with us and we said, look, here's our problem. All right, we're not seeing the development happening in these infill areas, but what are the issues? And it, it all boiled down to cost and price. Like, we thought, oh, they're gonna say it's like CEQA, and we're gonna have to go to the state and like, get CEQA for them, or they're gonna say it's like zoning. No, it actually came down to like, hey look, it's really expensive to upgrade the infrastructure in these areas. Because if you think about it, commercial corridors were built for single story strip malls. Some of them are actually industrial areas. And so the plumbing, like <laughs> this is really, I know it's boring, but look, it's important. The plumbing, right? Like the sewer and the water, it's not built for like three, four, five, six story buildings, let alone putting you know, people in those buildings. And there's no, Currently, no great way to pay for that aside from on the backs of a developer. Well, in an infill area, you've got smaller <coughs> parcels. For someone to come in and have to carry that cost that might be for an entire corridor, well, at that point, they're not going to do that, right? And so this is so this issue we started to dig into. And we came up with uh, this program, the solution for it, that we call Green Means Go. And this program, uh, we started out with this vision, okay, we're gonna identify the areas with cities and counties where they have policies in place to uh, support or facilitate um, residential development in their existing communities. These are places that in our long range plan, we've identified that if those places get built, they actually are, um, they generate less vehicle trips because people actually can walk or right, transit or take even shorter you know, car trips to places. What we need to do is now find the funding for it. And so, while this is, while we're developing our plan, we're also um, reaching out to all of our state partners. So the California Air Resources Board that um, has to approve our plan for its greenhouse gas targets, and to the Strategic Growth Council, and to the legislature. We're saying, look, we want to be able to meet all of the very um, uh, ambitious goals 
um, that the state has, right, for greenhouse gas reduction, for air quality. And in order to do that, we need your partnership. We need some funding for this. And so we advocated for three years, three years, <laughs> uh, to the state legislature, to state agencies, um, to try to get funding for the infrastructure for infill, to literally pay for the infrastructure for infill development. And, we, and, and guess what? Um, last year, I think it was last year now, we got it. Um, we asked for $400 million, $600 million was provided to the whole state. So it's, it's a down payment. So the Sacramento region got $38 million for the first time to be able to put into this grant program. Um, and, we, and we were able to do that. We, our board of directors, just awarded that funding to, um, to projects in the region, to projects in Green Zones in the region. The vast majority of that funding is for capital projects, meaning it's going to actually upgrade water and sewer and drainage um, in districts, right? Not just for one development, but for multiple developments to come online. We are so excited about that. And I want to share, oops, okay. Sharing just like a couple of examples here. These are like literally listed here because we, we we just awarded this to them. So Stockton Boulevard is a commercial corridor in the city and county of Sacramento, right? So between two jurisdictions where they are trying to bring on infill housing. And so we've awarded to that uh, to that corridor. Mills Crossing is at a light rail station in Metro Cordova. Boulevard, they've been working on that for over a decade, so they've got some funding to kickstart that. Sunrise Tomorrow in Citrus Heights is the re envisioning right of the Sunrise Mall, so we're paying for infrastructure work there. Marysville downtown, Marysville um, is, is uh, doing all kinds of planning to try to transform their, their community, so we've provided rewarding them planning funding for Marysville downtown. Uh, this is a picture, right, of one of the opportunity sites on Stockton Boulevard. So just to just to ground us in like what we're trying to do here, it's hard, hard work. It takes a region, it takes the cities and the counties, it takes every department, it takes the communities that live on these corridors to make, to, to make this transformation happen. And so Stockton Boulevard is an example right here. It's an infill area, um, it has locally supported policy, they need uh, funding to unlock over 5,000 new jobs, over 1,000 new housing units. We put funding towards that to be able to do that. Okay, so that's an example of Green Needs Go. It's the program that we want to be able to continue to build, to continue to advocate for. We want your help with doing that. And I think the last thing I'm going to say here is, going back to what James was sharing with you, we have community pop-up workshops happening in every single city and county in this region, and June 16th. Invite all your friends and family. With that, um, I think we're good to good to have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I know I'm back here. Um, <laughs> for that excellent presentation. Really meaty, right? Tons going on. Tons being factored into this blueprint process. What we really wanted to do now was, you know, to talk about some of the from the progress report to talk about you know the process that's been outlined here um, and really to have you know our friends at SACOG answer your questions um, and so I think the way we're going to do this is raise your hand and I'll come come to you and I see you've got the, the first question here um, but but basically that's essentially what we want to do is have a dialogue um, and I'm going to stay holding onto the mic because I, I've at events before I've made this a giving people and I'm going to stay together so here we go. Dude. My question relates to the integration with the other prompts. Um, I know you decided for a timeline integration, but I wonder how deep that integration is going to be with the fair and San Joaquin. Sure, thanks, Dan. Uh, Dan's referring to uh, as we as we developed this blueprint. It was our, not to get the weeds with you, uh, but our last plan actually we had to adopt early in 2019. So actually, this is the year we were ten. We were supposed to be adopting our plan, uh, but for lots of reasons, uh, a uh, we won this awesome federal raise grant, which actually we're going to work with Senate Thread to do outreach across the six counties to look at innovative mobility in disadvantaged communities, and we want time for that. Uh, it's going to be 
very hard to achieve our greenhouse gas target coming up uh, because of all the things we just showed you in terms of the progress report. And uh, we have a mega region working group with the Bay Area and San Joaquin uh, Council of Governments, as you mentioned. It puts us on exactly the same timeline as the Bay Area, so our plans sync up, and it puts us a year off all the Central Valley Councils of Governments. Why is that important? Because increasingly our regions are connected, people are moving back and forth, and we can't plan when the our, around our borders are static. That doesn't work, right? Because we actually believe we need Capital Corridor and the ACE train coming up here. I'm looking at Allison from KP. We need connections between our regions for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and that timeline, it's Assembly Bill 350, here on Gary Curry, will allow us to do that. So there's multiple reasons. Um, syncing up with our partners because increasingly we're bound to our our partners in, uh, across our borders, allowing for this raised rank to a lot of equity centered planning on innovative mobility. Um, and finally, the very hard task in front of us of having a plan that is ambitious but achievable to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from transportation out to the well, it's for the 2035 horizon here, but then plan all the way to 2050. It's a lot of work. We don't want to do it, you know, with, with in, sort of in our office with a couple of public meetings. We want to do it with a lot of public. So we are we are pushing our timeline back. It's a bit of an exceptional plan cycle, I would say. But that answers your question. Thanks for the question. I'm back here now. So again, raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, I have one, and then I'm going to go to Bill McGavern. Um, so you guys talked about the big investment in three weeks ago from the state. The governor's budget is what it is. A lot of folks know there have been a lot of cuts to some really important programs around climate and transportation. Um, where where are the the new opportunities um, these days? Considering that, yeah, it's a great question. Casey said it really well, right? We have the, we we at least um, had scope three years ago a four hundred million dollar need for all this water sewer stuff under the ground utility upgrades. Uh, honestly, these planning grants that Casey mentioned, I think, are going to raise that number now that people are actually doing feasibility studies to like north of half a billion, close to a billion. So where is that money going to come from, given the governor has proposed cutting things like transit, uh, the TERSIP program at the state level, tough budget here, right? Well, one place is the Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure bill, the bipartisan infrastructure law at the federal level. So uh, we are working really hard uh, with EPA, with HUD, uh, with USDOT, try to get those programs that are intending to reduce carbon emissions, build housing, address equity to work for our region. However, I will tell you, having spent a lot of time in DC, those are great programs across all the infrastructure classes. They are still in their little silos. So we're proposing Green Means Go at the federal level, and then we keep saying, well, just take, go to the door down the hall and go talk to EPA. I think they might be able to help you. So that is honestly where all of you come in, um, lobbying back here, lobbying back in DC, because you know, in some ways, the Inflation Reduction Act, from a climate perspective, and IJA from an infrastructure, we, we are primed. We sh we are we are the pilot region for the United States on this. Like we're primed, but for the bureaucracy and the silos, which is you probably all can guess, are not easy to break apart. So, but I'm 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 very hopeful and optimistic, and we need the state of California to do more for us. I know they've got a budget hole. But they've got to see us as investment worthy. All their current grant programs, frankly, we don't compete well in because um, the criteria they set are great for the coasts, but they're not great for inland California, the Central Valley. Thank you. Bill? Hey, Bill McGavin with Coalition for Clean Air. Thanks very much for the presentations. Um, you gave us a progress report on housing types. And that was really helpful. But I think there are some other important metrics that you haven't addressed, and includes really some. You said you're going to give us bad news. I think there's actually a lot of bad news that you skipped. Um, so I don't want really to depress you too much. I'm trying. Yeah. Well, um, from what I can tell, the blueprint didn't curb sprawl in this region, and neither did SB 375 or anything else. Uh, I'd like to hear about vehicle miles traveled. I don't think we're doing well on reducing those. I know that we're not doing well on uh, attaining national air quality standards. We're in violation 
the first smog or one of the ten smoggiest cities in the country. So to what extent do you look at these metrics and what can you tell us about how we're doing? Casey's got the answer for that. I'll just take, I'll take, I'll take the easy questions and can see. Uh, so the answer is we do look at all of them. And we and I affirm for you that they are not going in the right direction. I think uh, to in the interest of time, we we don't have those uh, environmental indicators here to share with you. We also have a whole bunch on the transportation side, like um, congestion and transit, and you know bike and walk share. They're all indicators really of quality of life and how well they're serving, and they're not going well either. So it's not we're not hiding that ball from you. Um, in fact. If want to engage on that more we got the process for you right that's what that's why we're doing this plan update that's why we're taking longer to do it um, so that we can try to have those difficult conversations can, can I just say something about 375 because I know this is a very active conversation I don't I, so we're trying to I, I feel like the only way that we're successful as a region is to be very honest with the state of California Right, so we're not out here saying things are great, you know, don't worry about anything, we got this covered. Um, I do think, having been here to the run of 375 and working in the Bay Area, going back to DC for 10 years and coming back, I do think 375 has made a difference. 375 actually got a lot of our local governments to rethink and reimagine and rezone and replan. I think it actually gave them aspirations and hope. And if you were around, a debate last year on a certain transportation tax measure, you heard the word 19% roll up people's lips because it does make a difference, it's important. But it doesn't actually add up, I think, yet to the kind of like change that we need. I'll also say, by the way, the state of California tells us to reduce carbon emissions, fine, but then they have a lot of investments that don't align with that very, from the state itself. And they don't give us, we're, we scrapped three years to get 38 million, as Casey said. Um, they need to invest a lot more. They need grant program, they need to understand, we're not, I'm not saying we deserve all the money, just 95%. Of them. <laughs> but that's, I mean, so it, again, we're, we're trying to be, we are trying to even tell our friends, and maybe we have some here today, Air Resource Support, HCD, right? Like, look, we're, we're willing to tell you where this is not working. We actually want to be your lab. We're in the front door, right, of all of the state of California trying to set this kind of like innovative global policy. We're also telling you it's not, there are major problems with how you're going about this. You can't build one size fits all. You have to invest in us. Um, so I, you know, is, has SB 375 solved everything? No. <laughs> like, no, it hasn't. I, but I do think it's made a difference. And I think there is a lot of work ahead of us still to align state policy with what regions and locals need to provide the right incentives. So, it, yeah. Okay. Can I add? Can I add one other way that it's working that probably doesn't get enough um, attention? SB three seventy five linked up our regional housing needs planning with the development of the long range plan. That tying those two things together has actually resulted in that um, really coordinating local land use policy for zoning with the sustainable community strategy. But the problem is, um, is that we're not getting the housing built. There's structural, right? There's structural and financial issues behind that. And so that is where 375 also can't solve all the problems. It's a planning law. And what we are trying to do now is implement. And there are problems in, our, in the structure of implementation that we're trying to solve. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Ralph. <laughs> I'm, I'm Ralph Proper. I'm with uh, Reef California and Ecos. Uh, just a uh, history of Ecos is also uh, uh, a few years ago that led to the first blueprint. I'm, I'm glad that we could uh, urge this on. Uh, as for the uh, upcoming blueprint, uh, Pathway 3, of course, is something that we uh, prefer, the uh, greatest amount of infill. But, uh, but I see it's, uh, if I uh, saw it right, it's about 88% infill. Uh, We'd like to see a higher percentage. Is, could there be a fourth uh, pathway considered? Why, uh, why limited to that? So um, the question on the pathway three. So the the fact is um, that there are uh, new developments.
greenfield developments that are under construction today. And so Pathway 3 is an acknowledgement of that, that if you have communities that are building out today, um, they're, they're gonna build out because we're in a housing crisis and we wanna see that happening. So that's, that's what you're seeing there, is just an acknowledgement of, of that reality. Um, if there wasn't any greenfield development that was actually under construction now, then perhaps we would see a pathway that doesn't have anything. Um, but we didn't want to throw today completely out. You should keep going with questions, but I have a question for all of you, which you can either think about now or get back to us on, which is, how do you think we can best engage this region to have this meaningful conversation? about the direction of this region, right? Because we have so many interests. Um, it, is, it is tough across six counties, right? But what we're basically trying to say is, let's, let's take some time to think about where we're heading, and let's figure out, is this, um, is this worth spending our time, right, and our effort to change the course of the future of our region? How do you think we can do that? We've got pop-up events, we have June 16th, we have a lot, but there's a lot of, uh, anyway, I just, I'm not expecting you'll have the perfect answer, right? But we're trying to figure out how we can do, get the region together and meaningfully figure out how we can get people to collectively understand the choices right now in front of us that lead to a more equitable, sustainable, prosperous future. Thank you. Discuss. <laughs> yeah, long question. I'm so sorry in advance. Uh, Chris White with Frontier Energy and I first say in my role of Frontier Energy, this blueprint is the envy of NPOs across the country. I am also the chair of the West Sacramento Housing and Economic Development Commission, and I'm also a Yellow County Climate Commissioner. So my question is related to those commission positions. Um, the pillars that you used the first time were awesome, but I didn't see anything about economic development in that. And as we're looking right now, the entire Sacramento system was built to bring people downtown to work at service-related jobs. But now our emphasis is really on bringing more technical jobs and manufacturing. So how can you add a pillar that really thinks about how we do this with more manufacturing being built at the edges of the region rather than service jobs in the middle of our region? Okay, I love that question. Um, you know, really, I think it's really important because I do think, um, I appreciate saying the blueprint is the, is the envy of the MPOs. I don't think, though, in general, in regional planning, we've done a good enough job at understanding the economic drivers. Um, so, uh, shout out to Evan Schmidt here at Valley Vision and a lot of our other partners got together. We brought Brookings Institution out here four years ago, right? And Brookings did this kind of economic analysis of our region. It was sort of like a stress test, uh, a little bit like me talking to my 16-year-old. And, and, and Brookings said, hey, you know, your indicators at the moment, they look okay economically. Your GDP is up, you know, your unemployment's down. This was 2018, 2019. But you have structural underlying issues here. Number one, you too rely on government. Number two, you have too many levels of government. Um, decisions are not clear or transparent, and it's, it's inefficient. And three, you have structural inequities by race, ethnicity, and income that are like a cancer on your region. You've got to fix those things and pay attention. And out of that came our prosperity strategy, which said the three, it's very hard actually if you look at the crystal ball in our economy, I'm just quoting from Kings to necessarily see clearly exactly what our play should be, but generally speaking, it's food and ag and ag tech, it's health and life sciences, and it's innovative mobility and sort of the future of, of, of transportation. Those should be our plays across our six counties. And manufacturing is right there, I think, in, in a very healthy way. So we need a blueprint and a plan. We talked about whether, what to show you this morning, this afternoon, because we had a lot to show you. We, we didn't we skipped over that. We skipped over our zero emission vehicle deployment strategy with uh, the Air District and SMUD and RT, but those are important from an air quality perspective, but also from an economic perspective. So thanks for the question. Thank you. And Shira actually had a bit of a response to your kind of call for ideas. Awesome. I so. love it. Look, it's already trickling in. Please. <laughs> Um, one suggestion would be to involve the local creative community. We 
have a robust creative community here, please utilize them. Um, there is a grant opportunity called Creative Core that came from uh, California State that Sacramento City um, is kind of like also in charge of one sector. And that is to utilize the creative uh, economy to outreach and do engagement exactly what you're looking for. So that might be a great opportunity for you. And to please, in this blueprint, include the creative economy. It was not included in the prosperity, and I'd love to see that included because the creative economy is part of economic development. Thank you. That's, that's point very well taken. Um, Right before I came to this job six years ago, we were working nationally on uh, getting some arts funding to embed artists in public works departments of all places, right? Mm -hmm. Partly because they actually were helping them do engagement and visualization um, around some major projects, including uh, actually getting art and murals into those major projects. I love it. Thank you. We can have a mic. Thank you. To, uh, thanks so much for the presentation. I wanted to weigh in a little bit about the aligned economic development planning that James was getting into. Although, before I do, I do want to suggest, James, maybe we could get both of our 16 year olds together and give them a lecture together as they prep for college. I think it'd be really helpful. And they just respond well to it. regional coordination right there. <laughs> Yeah, but I really um, appreciate the call out, Chris, about, about aligning economic development planning. And as SACOG is going through this process with the blueprint, we're going through a similar blueprint process with economic development planning in the region, and that's the Community Economic Resilience Fund. Um, Valley Vision is heading this up. We're actually starting, like, literally this month on it um, for a, uh, it's going to be an 18 month planning phase, but it really is zeroing in on how do we create an equity-centered and sustainable economy um, in our region with a focus on that low carbon piece. So I think all of the things that you brought up, really thinking about how are our sectors shifting, how do we support them best, and how do we create bridges for people into those, into those jobs is a really important piece of the work that we need to do as a region right now. And I think it's so timely that we're doing this at the same time as the blueprint planning we have for a long time been really aligned, or SACOG and other economic development entities, including Valley Vision, have been long aligned of thinking about how do we align infrastructure, housing, transportation with our economic centers and our planning together. So I think um, we have been in, in strong conversation about that and continue to be, and I think it's um, that's kind of the, the challenge of the moment right now is thinking about how we do that. All right, there's one all the way over there. Why don't you guys say some stuff? Yeah, hey, I got a perfect, got a perfect filler for you. Adrian. I just want to, I want to give a shout out. I should have done this earlier to our board member from Yuba County, Supervisor Gary Bradford. So, uh, Gary's on our board of directors. And not only do we take our board to different places like Salt Lake City and Denver and San Diego and look at kind of what they're doing, Gary comes back and writes blog posts that get picked up by the local paper and then tweets stuff out. And he's literally put Plymouth Lake on the state rail map, it actually now shows up for the extension up to Marysville Chico. So that's that's local leadership for you. Hi, my name is Veronica, Community Resource Project. Um, thank you for hosting this and allowing us to provide feedback. Um, but for the purposes of providing uh, more in-depth feedback in future meetings, wherever it may be, I was wondering if there could be greater access to take on data, specifically the 2020 and future um, areas of investment, location, jurisdiction, just so we can kind of assess a little, you know, better and provide these kind of uh, discussions. Absolutely. And I believe we even have the path, we will be having the pathways um, accessible on our website. Like there will be interactive maps. Yeah. Oh, and now they're on as well. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I was actually hoping if these would be. Uh, you're able to export um, some of this data because at the moment they're very limited, um, and I think there's more that we can do um, on our own part of that data. Yes, we can do that, and um, and actually, Clint Holtz is our kind manager up there, so you guys should talk afterwards. All right, we got a, one more question from Luis, and then we're going to transition to announcements. So if you you or your organization has an announcement to make, um, something you'd like to share, an upcoming event that might be related to air quality or something we talked about today. 
uh, we're going to go there next. But Luis is going to go. I'm going to give them one final plug to plug the survey of the June event, and then we'll transition to uh, to announcements. Great. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Luis Sanchez, I'm with Community Resource Project. We're an energy efficient um, installation organization uh, working on low income residences to make sure that they're uh, more comfortable and energy efficient as well as uh, reducing the uh, energy burden for, for individuals. Um, my question is, uh, you talked earlier and you mentioned equity. Um, as a lot of these fundings are coming down from the infrastructure bill and the IRA, um, they require, or most of those uh, agencies require uh, meeting the justice authority requirement to ensure that those benefits are in the low-income communities. And so there have been instances where local community organizations have participated in a lot of the different plans, discussions, um, but a lot of these organizations that are uh, established in this community lack the capacity building to continue to be engaged or to uh, collect input from their community constituents. And so, to what extent will your uh, blueprint incorporate some of those efforts to incorporate people's opinions and input, especially around the various different areas, housing, uh, mobility, uh, workforce uh, development trainings, and employment? Yeah. It's, a, it's an excellent question, and uh, Casey has been leading a lot of our work in our racial equity action plan and our engagement with our implement program. But you're right that the grants are coming, Justice 40, at the state level as well. And uh, our admonition always recently is do not check the box. If we just check the box on equity, we, will, we shouldn't be funded. Uh, we should be doing it meaningfully. I would, to, to the direct um, uh, input that we are trying to get on the blueprint itself, so we did, and some of our, um, our outreach staff are here, but we did do a call for, uh, for interest, for grants to community-based organizations um, to, to work with us, to receive a grant, to be able to then um, directly get input from the communities that they serve. Um, so we just had the first round of that that closed, um, but we will have a second round coming up later this year, maybe? We don't know, we don't, okay. It's not the staff who knows that here, but, but we will have a second round happening. Um, and that is actually part of why we are extending the timeline on our blueprint so that we can do meaningful engagement in communities that don't have the capacity to engage on something like a long range plan, but are very much affected by the outcome of it. Um, and so part of that is to allow us to, to try to give out the resources, you know, as best that we can to, to get that input and then um, have feedback loops along the way. Because um, at the end of the day, when this plan is adopted, we hope that it's, it'll be officially adopted by the State Cop Board, but adopted in whatever way others feel um, is, you know, most meaningful to them to then be part of the implementation of it. Thank you. So, we're going to transition to announcements. If folks have, thank you. Let's give a round of applause to <laughs> Thank you. A lot, a lot of content there. And absolutely, you know, take the survey that's, that's accessible via QR code on your paper in front of you. Um, and then we also have an evaluation for ourselves there. And then put, uh, what is it, June 16th on your calendar? What's the times for that? Do you have a time? 8.30 or 8, 8 a.m. or it's Mark? 8 a.m. till noon. 10 o'clock p.m. 12 p.m. 12 Community Center. Perfect. 8 a.m. 12, four hours, Folsom Community Center. June 16th. All right, good. So please raise your hand if you have things to announce, things you'd like to share, upcoming events. Things you'd like this, the folks in this room to know about. Um, if I don't see any hands, I'm going to start picking people. I see Sue. I see, okay, okay. Sue Karen with uh, Reef California and Sacramento Air Advice Applicants. Just wanted to uh, make sure everyone knows that May is Bike Month this 
coming out. So please get the rights out, uh, promote it at your workplace. We're really encouraging replacing car trips with light trips, even a few, especially those short ones that are under five miles. So um, please get out there and log on mayslightmiles.com. Free California is hosting the kickoff event on April 30th in Westside. Both of us actually three events out of the use of dual sponsors, a little more support financially and in kind. So if you haven't been asked but are able and willing, please let us know. We really appreciate more community support. Thank you. Thank you. Anything to, anything to add, Jennifer, or to cover it? You do a description of the event. So it's a three bike rodeo. It's a family friendly bike event for uh, aimed at getting kids on bikes, but it is also the main event for bike month kickoff event. So just to get everyone excited about cycling, it is going to be a beautiful day. It's 11 to 2, and it will be held outside of the Calsters building. Wonderful, thank you. Ralph. Yeah, um, Pico's putting on a uh, birthday again. I wish you love the earth. Uh, uh, April 23rd on Sunday, and uh, we'll guarantee good weather for that as well. <laughs> and, uh, and we mentioned too, our, uh, our planning committee is meeting again uh, on Monday evening. Uh, we're going to have a few speakers. Uh, uh, Tim Irvine, the uh, chair of the uh, Climate uh, Emergency Task Force for the county, is going to tell us what's happening there, how we can achieve uh, zero carbon uh, 2030 in shot. And uh, also we'll hear about uh, local area information uh, uh, commission uh, from an expert. And, uh, when we are here before, we will follow up on that uh, relative to school activities here that we don't like. <laughs> That's right. Anyone else? Here. Hi, my name is Drew Sarantis, and I'm with the Museum's Continuing Professional Education. We have a number of courses that address a lot of the issues that we talked about today. So if anybody is interested in learning more or educating yourselves or your community, um, feel free to go to the website. CDS College of Continuing Education. All right, cool. Thomas with Clean Start. Um, yes, so Clean Start's having a discussion with the CMC, SMUD, and CalSTAR, California Mobility Center, uh, at the CMC around charging and information around it for the uh, for light duty vehicles. And that's on the 23rd at 6.30 p.m. You can check out Clean Start uh, or you can Nice. Uh, I know our friends at the Sac Metro Air District uh, do a lot around air quality. They had a recent program that might still be happening where you could sign up and get a free air quality monitor. Do you guys still have more of those? Or, uh, and I know folks can sign up on the city's website, correct? Yeah, I have a very kind of Sac Metro Air District. Um, thanks for, for mentioning that. So, uh, we do have a community air monitoring program that we are working with the city of Sacramento. Uh, so it, it, it is on the city of Sacramento's website, but you can also reach it at the Air District website as well. Um, so if you'd like to give them these air monitors, it's not the federally recognized you know, regulatory air monitors, they're more of the smaller compact air monitors for our, our communities, then you can sign up there. There's a limited amount, so we do encourage our community to come in and sign up. Um, and then on a separate note, um, I also want to just give a big shout out to Galavision for having us all here and for the sake of the presentation that they did. So for many of you that have not read, a lot of the work that they're doing on race and equity is, is really awesome for our whole region. Uh, they are, have been leading us on getting all of the agencies collaborating together so that we can be aligned on our priorities for our region. And so I just wanted to also give a shout out to you. You. Did you have enough? Oh, okay. Thanks. Deb Banks with Sac Area High School Advocates. Well, you know, we're all about bikes, so I'm going to talk to you about May's Bike Month, the foremost of May's Bike Month. A uh, couple things. The Brief Bike Rodeo, that is a kickoff event, is going to be fantastic. We have two other big events. We have Resurrect, our Open Streets event that we did last year at Del Paso Boulevard. I want everybody to come out and experience fantastic, beautiful architecture by culture and love that is El Paso. And then also in the middle of the week, Ariana is a big sponsor for ours for a week of bike rides and in the end of party, which will be fantastic. So I would encourage all of you guys to not just sign up yourself, but to sign up a team, because teams 
work together, be together. And last but not least, this whole month is about increasing BMT, bicycle miles traveled, and decreasing DMT, vehicle miles Thanks. Wow. Well, thank you all so much for those wonderful announcements. I'm going to transition back to, to close us out with yes. us. Our wonderful co-chairs would like to say anything. But uh, just want to recognize you guys again. Eric White, Placer County Air Pollution Control District, and John Lane, Tigert. So please give them a round for their leadership. And just want to thank all of you for making the time today. I want to thank Christine Tien, if you raise your hand. Christine works for the California Endowment, and this is their space. So thank you, thank you, thank you for letting us use your space. Let's give them a round of applause. Big thank you to Valley Vision staff who supported this event. Laurel Smith, you want to raise your hand? Kathy St. Jude, Chris Hoffman, first Danielle. Danielle? There you are. Danielle, Evan Schmidt, the boss. So, again, thank you to, to all of you, to our fantastic lineup of speakers, to our sponsors, um, and, and let's, you know, let's keep these conversations going. We have these events quarterly. So we have your, your email um, by way of you attending this event. Uh, we will invite you to our next gathering. We have a different topic. And we look forward to, to having you. Thank you all again. And happy St. Patrick.